sports storming in college basketball? Is it time for it to come to an end? Cam Newton getting in the fights. Damn near brawls for crying out loud. And obviously, it might be time for the president to step aside. But should it be for Kamala Harris? That's just a few things on my mind. Not to mention the New Orleans Pelicans trying to troll me of all people. You wanted to start some shit? I'm here for it. Remember, you did this. You did this. The Stephen A. Smith Show coming your way right now. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you at the very least three times a week over the digital airwaves of YouTube. I am here with you on this lovely, beautiful Monday afternoon, live from Los Angeles, California, my road spot, my road spot. Before I move any further, let me take a moment to once again thank my followers, my subscribers, my supporters. Appreciate the love that y'all keep on giving me. This show has now eclipsed more than 571,000 subscribers. We continue to climb by the thousands each and every single day. Wouldn't it be possible if it were not for the love and support that you guys keep giving me and ladies keep giving me? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Keep on coming. And while you're doing so, make sure to click and continue to follow the Stephen A. Smith Show by clicking on the bell and boom. There you'll have it. You'll be right in as a latest subscriber. And while you're doing that, make sure you grab a copy of my new book, uh, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes. I call it new, but it did come out last January, except now it's out in paperback. You can go to straightshooterbook.com to get the book. That's straightshooterbook.com. Remember, it is a New York Times bestseller. It continues to climb. Thank you all so much for the love. Let me get right to it because there's several stories that I need to get into before I get to my man Roland Martin a little bit later uh, talking about some stuff on the political front. The first order of business is what transpired this weekend. Le uh, the debate over the dangers of court storming has been reignited this weekend after a player for the University of Duke was injured following their loss to Wake Forest. Demon Deacon fans from Wake Forest stormed the court as the clock struck zero in their victory over the Duke Blue Devils. Seven-foot center Kyle Filipowski was hit several times by fans running by. He was ultimately helped off the court after hurting his leg in a collision with a fan. Filipowski had this to say. Look at it right here. Quote, it's just really ridiculous how that situation is handled, Filipowski told WFMY News after the game. I absolutely feel like it was personal, intentional for sure. Like I said, there's no reason where they see a big guy like me trying to work my way off the court and they can't just work around me, you know? There's no excuse for that. Shortly after, he tweeted, this got to change. Let me say this. Court storm has been going on for a while. Looking up, reading from my notes, I remember 1961, point guard Larry Brown was playing for the University of North Carolina at Duke Cameron Indoor Stadium, went in for a driving layup in the last seconds, was bear hugged by a Duke player. Ultimately, fisticuffs ensued and fans ultimately got involved. I remember Bill Self, the championship coach for the Kansas Jayhawks, nearly got pummeled when fans stormed the court. Uh, after he had lost the game. I remember one time uh, when somebody was in a wheelchair and was about to be stampeded and had to be lifted up and helped off the court by a player or two. I remember that happening. This is not new. And a lot of people are making a big deal of it, as they should, because it is dangerous. It is played out. It's run its course, and, ch and change definitely needs to happen. But I think it's important to understand why it needs to happen. It needs to happen because a younger generation, as wild as it could be, still used to act within bounds, still used to act with a level of decorum and a level of respect that we don't see from the younger generation of folks in this day and age. When we talk about respecting our elders, we don't see that anymore. You've got young whippersnappers out here don't give two shits about anybody, about how anybody feels. And it's going to take a collective effort on everybody's part, the institutions, law enforcement, the media, and, 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 and beyond to really, really invoke and ultimately implement stiff, stringent 
ramifications for one's actions and transgressions. That's really what it's going to come down to. I'm not trying to sit up here, act like some old head or whatever the case may be. I'm just talking about people not having any regard for any rules and regulations. And repeatedly, I state this over and over and over again. Anytime any kind of change has taken place in any society is usually provoked by young people. Why? When we look, I'm in the media business and I'm on linear television every single day. And we see people talking about direct to consumer and that how that's the future, that's the wave of the future. We see all of these people with these digital platforms trying to get in on the action to make sure somehow, some way they could profit off of it and they could find themselves doing this job. We see all of that happening. But guess why it's happening? Because young people are always about doing what they want to do, when they want to do it, how they want to do it, with whomever they damn well please, devoid of any kind of ramifications whatsoever. They march to the beat of their own drum. And the reason why direct-to-consumer is ultimately popularized and it's really, really taking on a life of its own, because guess what? You don't have to watch something at 10 o'clock or 12 noon or 3 in the afternoon or 5. You can watch it when the hell you want. You don't have to watch it on a big screen television. You go to Best Buy or someplace else to purchase a television on. You can sit up there and watch it on your phone or your iPad or your laptop computer. You can do all of these things. The ability to do what you want, when you want, how you want to do it, in the fashion that you want to do it, devoid of any true ramifications, is something every society has to deal with. Because younger generations on the come up, that's how they like things. But that doesn't mean that the old heads in charge don't need to make sure to put their foot down and understand and to show and display these ramifications for everybody's actions. And if college institutions aren't willing to do it, shame on them. But I'll tell you why they're not willing to do it. It's because of money. You ever see some of these security folks, these people getting hired for security? Old, pot-bellied individuals, senior citizens, could barely walk, damn sure can't run. And I'm not engaging in ageism, and I'm not throwing anybody under the bus, and I'm not trying to be insulting to my elders or whatever. But you get older for a reason. You can't do the things that you used to do when you were younger. It's that simple. And to have them in a security role, what the hell are they going to do when you got hundreds of kids stampeding out of the stands onto the court? How in God's name are they going to stop them? You need some young, younger, vibrant, strong, healthy individuals who are security. Who, dare I say, can put you on your ass if they have to. That's what you need. But that costs money. And college football ain't about giving money away. They're about taking and soaking up as much money as they possibly can, which they've proven, proven to us time and time again in terms of how low, how slow rather they've been to make sure that ultimately NIL was in existence, transfer portals were in existence, student athletes getting compensated for their efforts and the revenue they generated for particular programs. You see how slow on the uptake it was for them to get to this point? Everything comes down to money. Nothing is free. And that's really what this is about. There's no way around it, y'all. There's no way around it. So I'm sorry that Filipowski got hurt. Hopeful and, and, and thankful that it doesn't appear to be as serious as one would originally have thought, even though he had to be helped off the court by his coaches and assistant coaches and some of the players. We get that. But in the same breath, you know something else? Here's another solution. Get security, which is younger, stronger, but also have them surround the visiting team. In most instances, when a court is being stormed, the home team that has won, they have the support of the home crowd. And they're soaking up all that adulation and celebration. It's the visitors who's the rival, who's the losing team that's usually in danger. Protect them first. And make sure come hella high water, you have them on the court. You have you surround them on the court and escort them out. That's what you do. That's the best you can do, y'all. You can talk about outlawing folks. What are you going to do, keep everybody on the court? Give them all citations? Give them all fines? Think you're going to be able to pull that off? Think they ain't going to cause mayhem? You think you got enough law enforcement officials or off-duty police officers or security personnel that's going to be able to police that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Spend the money to upgrade security. And by the way, when you storm the court, you got a license to get knocked on your ass. And you can't sue anybody. That'll go a long way. Trust me. Deterrence come in various forms. As we bring up Chris Rock and Will Smith. You notice Will Smith didn't slap Dwayne Johnson. 
Notice he didn't slap Mike Tyson. Notice he didn't slap somebody like that. You know why? Because size and brute strength matters. There's a whole bunch of people out there with size and strength on them looking to get paid. Give them a job of security and give them a license to whip somebody's ass. I promise you, deterrence will kick in. Let's move on. Second item on the list, Cam Newton. This is a sad story. Did y'all see the video posted this past weekend? It showed Cam Newton coming under attack by at least three men. Actually, I counted four. It happened at a seven-on-seven youth football tournament in Georgia. This video right here, you can see it in the video. The former Pro Bowl quarterback appears to be shoved by three people near the top of a set of steps before the pushing, shoving, and grabbing moves towards a fence line. The video lasts less than 20 seconds before the altercation is broken up by a police officer and event security. And you see how big that police officer was? You see how big that security person was? That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's what you need right there. And clearly Cam Newton had that at that particular location. Many have commented, by the way, that Newton certainly held his own considering he appeared to have been jumped. Newton has not yet commented on the situation. He last played in the NFL in 2021 um, for the Carolina Panthers. I hope y'all are not sitting here expecting me to cast aspersions on Cam Newton. Cam Newton was conducting a football camp. He's been known to constantly be about the business of giving back. And some group TSP, that's what they're saying some group top shelf promotions or whatever is a football program and some of the individuals, they attack them. I don't know how true that is, but I know this much. Cam Newton is always trying to give back to the community. He's always trying to give back to kids and he doesn't have to subject himself to some of the things that he subjected himself to. I've seen plenty of videos in the past with guys trying to call him out, acting like they could do something to him on the football field or talk about they were better than him or whatever. What happened to appreciating the fact that he's a former league MVP Number one overall pick out of Auburn. Got at the Carolina Panthers with a squad significantly worse than the one that Brock Purdy took to the Super Bowl with the San Francisco 49ers this year, by the way. Cam Newton took a Carolina Panthers team to the Super Bowl where they lost to the Denver Broncos. What about that guy? What about that former league MVP? To talk about him and to talk about him like he trash and for people to be getting in his face and stuff like that. Come on. Now, let me tell you something right now. Cam Newton, when have you seen a video of him being violent? I just saw the dude during Super Bowl week. I actually appeared on this podcast. Had a good time doing it. Cam Newton is a legit 6'6", 250. A legit 6'6", 250. In shape. I ain't talking about no 250 and most of it is blubber. This brother's built like a chiseled house. If he want to hurt somebody, he can hurt somebody. But I didn't see that. I saw Cam Newton being attacked. I saw people coming up behind him and trying to punch him in the back of his head. I saw him having his, you know, swinging somebody around and then somebody coming out of nowhere and trying to punch him in the face. That's what I saw. Now, at some point in time, my man Shannon Sharp, Club Shay Shay fame, nightcap fame, said it on first take on ESPN this morning. When he said, if I'm Cam, I do away with the camps or I heighten security. Well, security costs money. Why should Cam Newton spend if folks are unappreciative of it? And by the way, let me say something that I said on first take this morning. I'm going to say again right here on the Stephen A. Smith show. I've seen countless occasions where we see white quarterbacks conducting camps. I've never seen that happen to one of them. Why I got to be the brother? Why I got to be brothers pouncing on the brother? See, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about right here. Right is right and wrong is wrong, but it's a bigger problem than that plaguing our community. Do you see what we're doing to each other? We've lamented on many, many occasions How black folks do stuff to others that no other community does. I don't hear Jews calling other Jews non-Jews. 
I don't hear white folks question other people's whiteness. I don't hear Latinos question other people, uh, other people's ethnicities or folks, ethnicities within their own community. I apologize. We do that to each other. Coon, sellouts, name it. We don't hesitate to tear each other down. We don't hesitate to sit up there and denigrate and insult one another. We don't hesitate to sit up there and inflict violence upon each other. Now, I understand the old adage and the old rule. People do damage to their own communities every day. White folks do damage to white folks within their own communities. Latinos do the same thing. Asian Americans do the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. I'm talking about outside. I'm talking about on camera. I'm talking about the public excoriations and the penchant for violence. Who loses? Black folks make up 13% of the population, y'all, 13.6% to be exact. The Latino population is proliferating. White folks walk around thinking that some of them, not all, not most, but some of them, walk around thinking they got so much to be concerned about because they were once nearly 90% of the population. They've now dipped to 60% of the population and it's dwindling. You ain't the endangered species that black folks appear to be in terms of numbers. You would think that would be incentive to safeguard one another. That doesn't mean we can't disagree. It doesn't mean we can't argue. It doesn't mean we can't call right from right or wrong from wrong. But to go to this extent, Cam Newton is a good brother. There's nothing on his resume that shows an unwillingness to help his fellow man and woman, to help his community. I don't know what happened. I don't know the particular details. I'm not castigating anybody in terms of taking sides as to what transpired before the violence. I'm just talking about the violence that we witnessed on camera. It's inexcusable. There are people based on what we saw who should have been arrested. And to do this to Cam like he's nothing is pretty jacked up. Now I know what people are quick to say, particularly considering with the next subject that I'm about to get into, they're going to be like, well, Stephen A., who the hell are you to talk? I mean, you listen to the, the, the Kwame Brown, who doesn't seem to get clicks unless he's talking about me or Shannon Sharp. Or a host of other people who will remain nameless. Oh, we selling out because we talking about basketball or football and pointing out how this player might have played bad or is performing bad who happens to be black. But you ain't talking about what we say about the folks who are performing well, who also happen to be black. And oh, by the way, every time you got something to say negatively, it's about black people. But we the ones selling out. But I'm not even going to have to go there. At the end of the day, I don't want nobody harmed. I don't want violence inflicted upon anybody. I don't want anybody losing a paycheck. I don't want anybody losing their job. I don't want somebody like a Cam Newton who is trying to do good to literally be bum rushed and jumped. I don't want that. I don't want that. So thank goodness Cam Newton is healthy and everybody that was there is healthy and everything's good. But I just thought that needed to be said. Let me move on to a subject that's near and dear to my heart because it's about me. Um, Y'all heard about the New Orleans Pelicans and them trolling your boy, Stephen A., yours truly. Before we go to break, this is the last subject that I wanted to bring up because it involves me and that organization. Um, the Pelicans apparently were upset at me over what I had said recently on ESPN about Zion Williamson. Uh, it appeared last Friday on the show Get Up on ESPN. I was on at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time this past Friday. Live from Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota. The Pelicans currently is seventh in the Western Conference. Um, they've got a guy in Zion Williamson who's averaging a solid 22 points, five rebounds, and five assists per game. Am I still looking for more from him? Absolutely. And because I'm still looking for more from him, absolutely, and I said so, 
I want to remind y'all of what I said about Zion. Get up this past Friday. That seemed to ruffle some feathers. Take a look. Zion Williamson, it's not about his game. It's about how many burgers he's eating and whether or not he's going to be in shape or is he going to keep eating McDonald's and have chefs clamoring for him to come to their restaurants. That's what he has to prove, that the chefs don't love him any longer, okay? That he's committed to playing basketball and being in shape. Outside of that, you look at New Orleans and you say to yourself, okay, they can have a chance, but you don't know about it. Now, as you can see, that ruffled a few feathers uh, because, you know, you see the full screen right here, Wilt Chamberlain image, you know, you see it right there. Him and me, 100 points with me, 1.5 points. Now, of course, this is not the first time I have voiced these concerns over Zion Williamson and the Pelican social media team decided to respond by trolling me over my own short-lived basketball career with this tweet. Check this out right here. You can see it right here. They also put out a video of my finest bloopers, as you can see here, okay? Notice that I'm not afraid to show any of it, ladies and gentlemen. But it wasn't just the team social media coming after me. It was also one, uh, a former NBA player, one of his former players, Antonio Daniels. By the way, an NBA champion with the San Antonio Spurs, who's now a broadcaster for the Pelicans, who also has his own show on NBA radio each weekday afternoon. He had this to say later on Sirius XM NBA radio about me quote i'm all for objective fair critiquing of individuals and collectively of teams i felt what stephen a said this morning of zion was completely inappropriate and lazy if you have an issue there's a way to go about addressing that issue the pelicans have won eight of their last nine games but then you wake up this morning and this right here is the topic to me it's almost gotten to the point where it's personal stop right there all the fun went out the window the minute Antonio Daniels said that bullshit. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, let me say a couple of things. Number one, any words that I have to say about Antonio Daniels is strictly about his point of view there, nothing else. I am a frequent guest on his show. I like him personally. I think he does a great job. And I'm cool with him. I just disagree with two points that he made. Number one, personal stop. I don't know Zion that well. He's never done anything to me. I've met him a couple of times. His parents and I have spoken on a couple of occasions. Very, very nice people. Yes, I've spoken to his mommy and daddy. Yes. Check that out, Antonio Daniels. Okay? My opinions don't come out of thin air. That's number one. It's not personal. I'm rooting for the kid. I'm not rooting against him. Just like I was getting on Kyrie last year. I want you on the court because you're a superstar. What are we seeing from Kyrie Irving on the court right now with the Dallas Mavericks? A superstar. Just like I sit up there and I want James Harden on the basketball court. And I want him to show up in the postseason. Why? Because if he does, the Clippers could win the chip. I want LeBron James and them on the court. I don't want you sitting out games. Uh, 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 against the Golden State Warriors, but you're playing the very next night against San Antonio. That's not what I want. It's not personal. I'm a basketball fan that want to see the greatness for basketball players. Clearly a level of greatness I did not possess. So let's get that out the way. But then to sit up there and to say lazy, well, congratulations on that, Antonio Daniels. It's the first time in my career I've ever been labeled lazy in anything that I've done. Anytime you want my work schedule, my brother, we can have a conversation. Let's see how much work you can put in. Come on now. That was unnecessary. You might say, well, what Stephen A said about Zion was unnecessary. Well, damn it, let him speak for himself. Do I have to get into details about the issues that the New Orleans Pelicans have had with keeping him from stuffing his face and his stomach? Do I have to go into detail about how this brother has hidden food? Literally, I'm not speculating. Hidden food from y'all because you work for the Pelicans too. So we wouldn't know how much he was eating. Stop. Stop it. You know it's true. I've been covering the NBA for 30 years. You know how much stuff I could say? But you know I never would.
Because I don't violate people and I don't violate trust like that. But don't come to me talking about I'm lazy. What I was saying was Greeny Mike Greenberg was asking about the threats within the Western Conference. I specifically said it's no concern about Zion Williamson, the player. The concern is about how many burgers he's going to eat. That's what I said. In other words, I wasn't talking about the recent winning streak. I wasn't talking about their top six spot and avoiding the play in in the Western Conference. I was talking about the long haul as the playoffs approach. April, May and June. Not right now. You understand English Antonio Daniels. You know, that's not what I was saying. I was talking about down the road. But since you want to bring up laziness, how about I bring up when it comes to you, honesty? How honest are you being about Zion? He don't have a food issue. The best chefs in New Orleans don't know him by name. They don't try to shuttle car services to see him, to get him, because they love his business. I'm exaggerating. He didn't have a weight clause. They ain't concerned about his diet and his weight and his contract. I'm making this up. I'm making this up. Come on, man. Come on, y'all. In New Orleans, um, you didn't think I was going to let you off the hook, did you? I don't know who put you up to that. But you need to be educated a little bit more about Stephen A. Smith. So allow me to educate you. Number one, I don't give a shit. It doesn't bother me that you troll me. I can take it. You see, do you realize that at Division II Winston-Salem State, I could have been on the court averaging 20 to 25 a game, and I still wouldn't compare to a single one of y'all? who've made it to the NBA. Do you understand that I know that no matter how you gloss over anything, meaning myself or anybody else, I don't compare to y'all, but your stats are wrong. One and a half points is less than that. I was hurt. I was hurt. Go to the hospital in Winston Salem, 1989. I cracked my kneecap in half. They told me I might never be able to walk the same again. And even though I maintained my scholarship, I was nothing more than a practice player because I couldn't run up and down the court more than three or four times without limping. How do we know this? Because I'm 56 and I still limp after running for a little while. I'm not lying. Period. You want to throw, show me air balls when I shot air balls. That was with me and James Harden a decade ago. When he made me shoot, shoot in a suit and tie before I did an interview with him with no warm-ups. You missed me shooting last week, though, didn't you? You missed me shooting last, last year at the finals, didn't you? You missed a whole bunch of stuff. That's neither here nor there because it doesn't matter. I couldn't shine Zion's shoes, nor C.J. McCollum, more, nor Brandon Ingram, nor any of them. That's why y'all in the NBA and I'm not. But let me tell you something about you, New Orleans, because since we want to be up here and we want to make sure that we're as thorough as we can possibly be. Let's talk about the New Orleans Pelicans franchise for a second here. You're in your 22nd season in New Orleans. Since your relocation from Charlotte. Ladies and gentlemen. Do you know that by being named the Hornets and then the Pelicans, you have as many names as you do playoff series victories in 22 years. You've won two playoff series in 22 freaking years. You have the same amount of playoff series victories as you do names. And you talking about me? At least I'm not robbing the, the public by getting paid for doing, for not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, which was win. But I'm not finished. That same New Orleans Pelicans team. NBA ranked for regular season winning percentage since 2002-2003. You're 21st out of 30 teams. Did you know that? How many division titles do you have in 22 years? 
One. One. Playoff series victories, I already said, two. Playoff record in that time. You're 22 and 33. That's a 40% winning percentage. NBA ranked for postseason win percentage since 2002-2003. 25th out of 30 teams. Oh! Conference finals and NBA finals appearances in that time. That would be zero. Nada. I was joking around about Zion Williamson not eating too much. We need him healthy on a good diet so he's strong and he's powerful. I did not imply that he's not doing it now. I said it is a concern, Antonio Daniels. I said it is a concern, New Orleans Pelicans. And I was half joking because I'm rooting for the kid. And I'm rooting for the franchise. It's a great city. Best restaurants in America. Great fan base. I might have teased y'all about the Smoothie King Arena or whatever the hell it was when Anthony Davis was there and all of that other stuff, but I enjoy my time there. David Griffin is a hell of an executive. Willie Green is a hell of a coach. C.J. McCullum is class personified, one of the best people you'll ever meet in your life. And by the way, trolling me, I don't care. You want to take a boxing video when I got two torn rotato cuffs from, from, from seven, eight years ago and I'm throwing, fine. You want to sit up there and show me with a pot belly and me looking, you clearly haven't looked at me. You clearly haven't seen the transformation. I'm 56 and I'm doing it. And I'm talking to you about one of your players under the age of 25 who can't. And your response is to troll me? Instead of noticing your own record, your own futility, your own failures. How many times we've been looking at the New Orleans Pelicans and saying they could be in the Western Conference Finals? That would be me. I'm the one that said that. These are facts. You want facts? Is that lazy, Antonio Daniels? Is that lazy? I want to emphasize I'm only addressing his quote. Not Antonio Daniels. He does a hell of a job on the NBA show. He's invited me on on many occasions that I've been on. And I'll go back again. I love the brother. He's good people. I just disagree with his quote. We can disagree without being disagreeable. You my brother. We good. I just disagree with your quote. But come on, y'all. Pelicans, really? Oh, by the way, I forgot one last thing. Since you called me out on Friday, you've lost every game since. I mean, damn. Is that not an indication that your priorities need to get in order? Stop worrying about Stephen A. Smith. There were those before me, and there will be those after me. What do you think they're going to say about you if you continue to be this futile? Get it together. Get it together and stop worrying about me and start worrying about Dallas and Sacramento and Minnesota and Oklahoma City and the Clippers and the Denver Nuggets and the Los Angeles Lakers and the Golden State Warriors. That is your enemy. Those are your opponents. Those are the people you need to be concerned about. As for me, I'm going to say this couple of things. Number one, my boxing coach is begging me to just put out a video because he can't stand that me leaving that video. Up there. I like the video up there because I want people to think that's how I fight. So if you roll up on me wrong, you'll get your ass kicked. That's me personally. I like to think I fight like that. But no, neither here nor that. I might do another video just to show you what a lie it is, but it's okay. You know why it's okay? Because I'm 56. I'm a grown ass man. I'm not trying to fight. I'm not trying to play basketball anymore. I'm not trying to do those things. And for those of you who want to laugh at me, at these misnomers and these videos that they put out there and they talking about me, let me remind you of something. I don't get paid to do those things. 
I get paid to do this. Who's been number one for the last decade? Did you forget? That would happen to be me. And no matter what comes down the pike with somebody else who will ultimately supplant me as number one, that means, it still doesn't mean, I'm sorry, that it takes away from the fact that I've been number one. And I'm still climbing. Basketball was good enough to earn me a full scholarship ride to a four-year institution that enabled me to get my degree, ultimately become a professional journalist, ultimately become a top-notch pundit, one of the best in the history of this country, who, by the way, gets paid handsomely for it. And, oh, by the way, I'm a New York Times best-selling author. This is what I do. And I've been number one at it. Can you say you've been number one at anything, New Orleans Pelicans? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Albeit rhetorically. Because we all know the answer. Grow up. Dial it back. And win some damn games in the playoffs so I can have the pleasure of coming to the wonderful city with the wonderful fan base that is the New Orleans Pelicans, which is being exceptionally run by Mr. David Griffin and their ownership. Fall back and focus where you need to be focused. Eric Bieniemy. Donald Trump, Kamala Harris, Roland Martin, and more coming up next. Don't go anywhere. You're listening and watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube and beyond. Back with more in a minute. The NBA season is ramping up, and the playoffs are just around the corner. And I don't know about you all, but I need to be part of that action. So how do I do that? I use Prize Picks, of course, the largest fantasy sports platform in all of the land with more than 3 million members. It's not only super exciting, but incredibly easy to play and takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. All you do is select two or more players from the NBA, the WNBA, or MLB, and then choose more or less on their in-game stats, which means every assist, basket, or hit will turn the big game's energy into straight cash. So... If I know that Steph is hitting four threes and Draymond is grabbing 10 rebounds tonight, I need to pick that and play for a chance to be rolling in some big time money. And get this, prize picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. That's right. Go to prizepicks.com and use code SAS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's code SAS. When you go to prizepicks.com, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. Before I move on beyond the world of sports, I wanted to touch on one last sports topic just real quickly. And that's Eric Bieniemy. Um, he's gone as the offensive coordinator for the Washington Commanders. Um, obviously, he was the former offensive coordinator for the Kansas City Chiefs under Andy Reid, uh, where he helped uh, Patrick Mahomes um, and the crew capture a couple of Super Bowl championships. Major props to him. Well... <clears throat> Now he's heading to UCLA to be its offensive coordinator. So he's going from the NFL to college. And there's a lot of people that are going to keep bringing up how something is wrong. How is this man, who's a two-time Super Bowl champion, who was considered an elite offensive coordinator, how in the hell is he not a head coach in the National Football League, particularly as an African-American? Ladies and gentlemen, I've spent years asking that very same question. I've spent years um, lamenting the state of affairs as it pertains to the National Football League and black coaches. I've spent years coming to the defense of Eric Bieniemy. Not anymore. Can't do it anymore. Here's the deal. When I think about Eric Bieniemy, I think about the fact that D'Amico Ryans got the job in Houston. I think about Mike McDaniel, 
biracial who's in Miami. Think about Mike Tomlin, who's been in Pittsburgh for 17 years. Think about Todd Bowles, who Bruce Arians helped ascend to the head coaching position. He's been a head coach in Tampa over the last two seasons. I think about guys like this. And here's my point. As of January, this past January, there's about nine head coaches who are black. Atlanta's Raheem Morris, he got that job. Gerard Mayo in, in New England, Antonio Purse got the interim tag stripped from him, and he's in um, Las Vegas. Uh, Dave Canales, Canales uh, he's in Carolina. I'm just looking at some of this stuff, and I'm saying to myself, what am I supposed to say for Eric bien at this point? He has been interviewed at least 15 times for 14 different head coaching jobs. And not one time did he walk away with the job. At some point in time, it has to be you. I'm not questioning his football acumen. I'm not questioning his resume. I'm saying that during the interview process, something's got to be you if you've gotten 15 different interviews from 14 different franchises. And other blacks have been hired and not you. Because the reality is, is that the NFL is hiring black coaches now. They just ain't Eric Bieniemy. I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know this. I can't imagine that his aspirations for being a head coach on the NFL level. The chances of that have increased because you decided to depart from the NFL altogether to go take an offensive coordinator's job on the collegiate level. Had you gone to UCLA to take the head coaching job, had you gone to a college program and taken the head coaching job, that would be different. But to leave the NFL to go to college for the same position? I don't know what to say anymore. I don't know what to say. Let me move on beyond the world of sports to the political stratosphere here because former President Donald Trump won comfortably over Nikki Haley in South Carolina, in the South Carolina primaries. Um, her support is dwindling before our very eyes. It's a foregone conclusion that he is going to be the GOP nominee for the presidency of the United States of America. And right now, regardless of what anybody is saying, despite four indictments, 91 counts against him, a recent civil suit where the plaintiff was awarded in excess of $400 million. Donald Trump, excuse me, not for over $400 million, It's a $354 million settlement. $354 million settlement. That's what they said. To be paid by Donald Trump and Donald Trump Enterprises. For all of this stuff to be going on against him and for him to still be the GOP nominee. It says a lot about where our country is. Now, some people would sit up there and say, well, you know what? That just shows how bad we are. No. It also shows how bad those folks think the rest of the country is. Because they look at our political apparatus. They look at our politicians on Capitol Hill. They look at the kind of things that are getting done, and they're saying they have an aversion to it. And when people want to sit up there and say he just he just caters to to uh, the the white audience or whatever, well, Donald Trump wants to cater to whoever's going to get him votes. One thing he's proven is that he ain't prejudiced when it comes to taking from people from from, from you know to get what he wants. He don't give a damn who gives it to him. If it's going to lead to him being victorious, he'll take it. He don't give a damn whether the person's green. And that's just the way it is. And whether it's MAGA Republicans or it's Republicans that don't pride themselves in being MAGA, but they have to act like they are because they're fearful of his impact on their constituency and how it will affect their futures in politics, it doesn't matter. He owns the Republican Party right now. He's going to be the nominee. Which begs the question, who's going to beat him? The Republicans and folks on the right have done a sensational job of highlighting the flaws, the struggles, the ageism 
associated with Joe Biden, our president. And they are making a strong case against him. And Joe Biden refusing to do an interview on Super Bowl weekend, I got to admit, makes you think something's wrong. And if you're thinking something's wrong and you're thinking that he's not going to have the capacity to, la to, to last and you're thinking that somehow, some way, there's going to be a new nominee for the Democratic Party and what have you, and we're going to learn about it at the Democratic National Convention, there's only two names that's going to prop up. It's going to be Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. Or it's going to be Vice President Kamala Harris. We may not have wanted to ask those questions. We may not have fantasized or even envisioned that that was a possibility. Some people may still say it's not a possibility. Some people may say it is. But here's the one thing that is for certain. There's nothing certain about the Democrats right now. We know what the Republicans are going to do. We know who their candidate is going to be. We know they're all in on him now. And those who are left out of the mix will get in line soon enough because they understand what's at stake. And their whole thing is about winning. You the Dems, what you going to do? Kamala Harris, can she be somebody that will curry votes and support from the Democratic side? Will she get enough people to the polls to say to hell with Trump? We don't want him in office. We want her. Can Gavin Newsom do that? Or are they going to just do whatever the hell it is that they can do to make sure that Joe Biden is in that position? Lots to think about, lots to discuss, and who better to do it with? Then my buddy, um, he's got his own show. He's doing big things. And I could not wait to talk to him. My guest is the host of Roland Martin Unfiltered, a daily show that focuses on news, politics, culture, and obviously so much more. He's been on before, and he's back right now to give us his thoughts on all the latest political news. I had to talk to him, especially after what I saw transpire this weekend. Uh, welcome to the show, the one and only, Roland Martin. What's up, Big Tom? How are you, man? How's everything? Glad to be back out here fighting these allergies in Virginia, but I'm all good. Well, well, first things first. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't even want to say where the hell you look like you're going with that cowboy hat on that outfit. Tell my audience, what, what, what's up? You rocking a cowboy hat right now? Where you on your way to? Let's get well, that out the way first. Well, first off, you know, my H-Town homegirl, Beyonce, has the number one country song in the country. Okay. Uh, yes. Texas Hold'em. Yeah. So, right. and plus the, the Houston rodeo, the largest in the world started, starts this week. So I had to represent uh, my hometown. All right. Okay. That's a perfect explanation. No doubt about it. Let's get right into it, Roland, yes, because we saw the South Carolina GOP primaries take place uh, over this weekend. We saw another romp courtesy of Donald Trump beating Nikki Haley. Convincingly, I might add the former governor of South Carolina losing convincingly your thoughts about whether or not, she, I, I think she should call it a day. It's over. I think it's clearly obvious. It's been over for a while. She's determined to stay in the race through Super Tuesday. But her support is dwindling before our very eyes. And clearly, nobody is standing in the way of Donald Trump. Your thoughts about what transpired there? Well, first, the Coke Network has already said they're pulling their campaign funding uh, yep. behind her. She doesn't have a, a pathway. Uh, I think uh, she understands that Donald Trump uh, poses an existential threat uh, in terms of to the country. Uh, and what she is hoping for with all these court cases, that something will happen that will cause that support to dwindle, but it's not going to happen. His supporters are locked in. And the reality is there are a lot of Republicans who privately, they cannot stand him but they are afraid of the supporters. So therefore there's really no pathway for her. And so there's no doubt he's going to get the nomination. So now it just simply comes down to Trump versus Biden in November. Does it really come down to Trump versus Biden, Roland, or do you see something transpiring with so much being made uh, about, I I'm not going to disrespect the president of the United States. I'm not going to disrespect Joe Biden like that. And, and by the way, when I bring up his age, I'm not engaging in ageism. I'm not engaging in any kind of insults whatsoever, but he clearly does uh, appears to have slowed a bit and has lost a right. step a bit. Do you foresee him being the Democratic nominee, the Democratic nominee, and really, really going against Trump and trying to get four more years? I do. I do. So, again, barring anything health-wise happening, 
uh, between now and November, I think he is the nominee. Uh, there's no doubt, that, yes, that he has, uh, you could say he slowed a bit. But, but here's the thing uh, that I got to remind people about. So, look, the dude was 78 when he got elected in 2020. So I wasn't, I wasn't clueless about who I was voting for in 2020. But let me remind all the people out there uh, who are like, oh, my God, we need more options. OK, these were the people also running. But Senator Bernie Sanders, Representative Tulsi Gabbard, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Mike Bloomberg, Senator Amy Klobuchar, Mayor Pete Buttigieg, uh, Tom Steyer, former Governor Deval Patrick, uh, mm -hmm. Michael Bennett, Andrew Yang. And so voters didn't pick any. Of, also, remember, Senator Cory Booker, Senator Kamala Harris. All of them were in the campaign. That's right. Voters didn't pick any of them. So for people to go now, oh, my God, we got to have somebody. Look, if, I, if I'm if i Biden Harris and if I'm Democrats, what I'm doing is I'm stop whining. I'm stop complaining. I'm stop fretting. And I'm saying he's going to be our guy. And what I'm going to say is, do you are you concerned with somebody who you want to be out there who's virile and jogging? Or do you want somebody who got stuff done? And that's what they should be focusing on. They should be saying, we got the infrastructure bill done. We got Build Back Better done. Inflation Reduction Act done. HBCU funding done. Insulin for, for 35 capping at $35 done. They should be focusing on competence and getting stuff done. Well, they are allowing the narrative to be driven about his age. They should be saying, who do you want? An 82 year old dude who gets stuff done? Or somebody mm -hmm. who's younger, who doesn't mm -hmm. get anything done. Let me let, let me say this to you, Roller. I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm going to pull a first over here. I'm going to push back. I'm going to push back on the great Roller Martin because see, I'm in your lane. So I know my place. This ain't sports. I'm in your lane. So I, right. I, I, I let me let the American people know. I know my damn place when it comes to me talking to Roller Martin about politics. Okay, this is my boy. I defer to you most times. Let me play devil's advocate and push Go back. Ahead. The subject is not. What Biden has done. If you're a Republican, you're a GOP member, you're going to have problems with what he's done. You're a liberal, you're a progressive, you're a Democrat, you're going to have very few problems with what he's been able to accomplish. To me, that's not the story. I don't think it's an issue of what he's done. I think moving forward, you're wondering what can he do over the next four years right. because of the slippage you may have seen in him health-wise. I think that that is the argument that folks have made. And I'll say this before I let you <laughs> chime in. I've been on the record saying this. I think the Democratic Party should be utterly ashamed of itself because in the year 2024, we are practically begging this soon-to-be 82-year-old president to run for re-election because as a party, we couldn't find anyone else that we believed could beat Donald Trump. Now, to right. me, that is a problem with that. Not Biden. Now, it's not his fault. Right. All of us getting older. This ain't Mork and Mindy from back in the day. We ain't getting younger. We all get older. It's not a crime against him. But I do think it's unreal that the Democratic Party, who prides itself on being progressive and forward thinking, is depending on this man to win the presidency. That's a lot to ask of him, Roland. And that's my issue with the Dems. To that, well, you say well, what? Well, keep in mind, if Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, okay. you would have right now a 76-year-old in her second term. Okay? okay? So you have to think about the election, not just in terms of 2020, but also what happened in 2016. And so the reality is Biden was the candidate at that time who brought experience, competence, stability and no drama think about this here you haven't had any cabinet resignations you the only drama you've had was was the secretary of defense not that's telling true. them when he went to the hospital and so they've been drama free frankly that's been great i do think there's some media reporters out there in dc who love the drama of trump uh and so i under i understand your point about well there should be younger people but here's the deal the democrats bench is deep right now it is strong but the reality is the last president who opted not to seek a second term was president lyndon baines johnson so the mo so voters had to, the moment he won in 2020 he was running in 2024 and again i believe 
what they have to do is they're getting sucked into this, well, I need to have them here and here. No, their deal needs to be what we accomplish and, because I've not heard this yet, what we plan on accomplishing in the next four years. It's, a, it's about establishing competency. And if I'm them, I'm also driving home the no drama, the, the all the other stuff. That's what I'm doing. I'm saying, guess what? We didn't have the craziness that happened when he was there. It was stability. And so that's what they have to be arguing. I just believe they're making, they're playing right into the media narrative of old, feeble, as opposed to no, competence. And we need a competent leader who can be trusted with the secrets of the country. But what about Biden playing into it? You got Super Bowl Sunday. You got over 100 million viewers out there. That was a mistake. He didn't do an interview. And that was a mistake. He absolutely should have done it. I understand not wanting to talk to Fox last year. I get it. Right. But he absolutely should have done the interview on Super Bowl Sunday. That was a mistake by his people. And again, I think what they're doing is uh, that even like even when he after the special prosecutor report came out, he had mm -hmm. already made comments earlier at the uh, at the House uh, at the Democratic caucus meeting at Lansdowne Resort, right literally right next door to where I live. And he then goes to the White House and comes out again. For what? I already spoke on that. And so the mistake that they're making is they're not taking advantage of certain opportunities. Now, Vice President Kamala Harris, she's on the road. She's doing various events. But they've got to have him in the right positions. And so his team failed him on that mm -hmm. mark. He should have done that interview. Yeah, I I think you're right, but I also think there's a reason they didn't do it. And I think it leans towards giving fodder or credence to some of the things that people on the right have been speculating about. Because I certainly thought that was the first thought that jumped to my mind when I didn't see him capitalize off of an opportunity to speak to 100 plus million people. But you brought up Vice President Kamala Harris. And I'll say this to you, Roland. We haven't heard enough about her. I'd ask you why. Actually, I mean, actually, I, you have. Here's the deal. Think okay, about go this ahead. here. You've heard more about Vice President Kamala Harris than you have heard from every vice president combined in the last 50 years. Nobody ever talks about the vice president. Nobody. You cannot tell me, one, other than misspelling potato, you can't tell me anything that Dan Quayle did. Dick Cheney was very powerful, but he was behind closed doors. Mondale, yeah, but you heard a lot about Dick Cheney, though. You heard a Mondale, lot about Dick Cheney. Cole. You had people thinking he was running the country. Right, right. But but the reality is she has been out more. I think the problem is people have an expectation for her that surpasses what the VP actually does. The VP is not even a constitutional position. She serves at the pleasure of the president. Her job is, frankly, to be back up in case anything happens to him. That's really what her job is. And so Biden, what he's done, he's actually had her out front more than any other VP. Think about how many times, do you, can you recall President Obama having Biden speak before him? Nope. So the reality is she's been out there. But one of the things that she was hurt by was the first year and a half of the presidency was COVID. She literally was stuck in D.C. And the second thing is, because the Senate is tied, she had to stay close to D.C. for tiebreaker votes. She broke the record of the most tiebreaker votes by vice president. So right. part of the problem is she has not been able to be more uh, out into the public, but she's been out more than any other but, vice president. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. You're right. And I appreciate the education on that. But isn't that when you think, when you consider how she performed when she was a presidential candidate uh, going up against Biden and those folks at the time, Obviously, she didn't resonate, um, and I think that that has to be taken into consideration as well. You have a lot well, of people who don't believe in her yeah. in a general election. But I want to read you a quote from the Wall Street Journal just this weekend because I wanted you – it was written by a, a columnist there. I believe it was uh, Holman W. Jenkins Jr. He wrote in this week's Wall Street Journal. I want to put it up on the big screen for you sure. right here, Roland. Here's what he said. It's time for Mr. Biden to step aside – uh, he said the time for Mr. Biden to step aside is now. In Kamala Harris, Americans might discover 
a forerunner of a new breed of Democrat who actually believes in jailing criminals. It is an impossible to imagine her brushing aside a softball Super Bowl interview to tell 123 million Americans she didn't become the first black female president to toss away the greatest generation's 79 year investment in global peace. If nothing else, President Harris would bring to the table a quality missing in the current two front runners, which would be obviously Trump and Biden. She would have to live in the world made on her watch. That's what they're saying. That's a potent argument. Some would say on behalf of Kamala Harris. How do you feel about that? I have no idea what the hell he talking about. <laughs> like, I mean, like, literally, as you were reading it, I was sitting right. there going, what the hell is he talking about? He's talking about moving President Biden aside so I, Kamala Harris can step in and be the Democratic nominee to go up against Trump. That's what but, he's saying. But he's talking about world peace and the greatest generation and jailing criminals. Here's the deal. Crime under President Biden and Harris has dropped. Major crime has dropped. What you what you you have a narrative. no, he was complimenting her. He was saying that she would put away criminals. And I guess he was pointing to her time as the attorney general in California, which, which is also which is also a lie that folks have been advancing because she was actually one of the architects of being smarter on crime as opposed to just jailing everybody. Look, okay. here's the deal. What we have to recognize is that um, one uh, that happens. You have complete upheaval. Okay. You have upheaval across the country, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you have people who are articulating and saying, well, well, maybe you have a brokered convention. More upheaval. The reality is this here. Biden is going to be the nominee. Vice President Harris ain't going nowhere. So what? So if you look at the polling data, Democrats are the ones who, oh, my God, we don't know. Democrats, this is very simple. Shut the hell up and get your asses in line. Because you know what MAGA is doing? Getting in line. A lot of people who say things about Trump, they're getting in line. They understand what the stakes are. This is the problem with Demo Democrats have a have a unique ability to snatch uh, to snatch victory so out of the jaws of defeat. They will sit here. Democrats will pass a bill and complain about what wasn't in the bill versus celebrate what was in the bill. They, Democrats need to shut up and be locked and loaded and saying we are taking Trump and MAGA out. We're going to take control of the House. We're going to keep the Senate and keep Biden in. That's the choice unless something happens with his help and he opts not to run. As of today, he's running. They need to accept that reality. Ain't nobody coming on a white horse in a white cowboy hat saying, I'm saving the day. It ain't Gavin Newsom. It ain't Gretchen Whitmer. It ain't anybody else. This is your pick. And the bottom line is they've, they've accomplished things. Democrats have got to learn to understand about getting in line. He's running. Deal do, with it. Do you believe that Gavin Newsom has done that? He certainly has said that in terms of his support for Biden. He certainly has said that in terms of if it's not Biden, it would be Vice President Kamala Harris. But nevertheless, he was the one on Fox News, on Sean Hannity's show, debating Ron DeSantis over policy. And he it wasn't have. just the state of California versus the state of Florida as, as they portended it to be. It was far more than that. So there are some people out there who have said, and others, although a small, a small portion of them, who right. have clamored for his ascension within the ranks of the Democratic Party. But do he, you believe that Gavin Newsom has done what you said the rest of the Democrats should do? Absolutely. First of all, Newsom is, already, Newsom is focused on 2028, okay? That's what he's doing. But he's doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing. And that's what Governor Wes Moore should be doing. That's what Governor Pritzker of Illinois should be doing. That's what Governor Shapiro of Pennsylvania should be doing. That's what they all should be doing. They, they, all, they should be going on the offense, not playing defense, Offense, attack, 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 beat them down. They're not doing that. And so we look at these polling data, and let's be real clear. What's, what's happening to Israel and Hamas is having a huge impact on young voters. Tell us but why. Get, Tell us why. Tell us why. Well, 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 because young voters are against the slaughtering of children, and right. they want to see a ceasefire. Biden is trying to do this thing diplomatically, but it's not playing well. He's running out of time. It's going to be a problem in a state like Michigan with a huge Muslim vote. It's going to impact that. 
but he's also got to deal with the reality. The election is coming down to seven max eight states, Georgia, North Carolina, which Biden lost by 2.5 points last right. time, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Nevada. Those are the seven. OK. And what he has to do is people could say, well, he might barely win. Let me tell you something. Barely winning in politics is like winning, winning. Super Bowl by one point. You still won. Mm. His job right now, they should be on the offense every single day. They mm. are playing defense and they're hiding. His people need to wake up and go on the offense every day. Well, let's get deeper in this because you're more qualified than most to talk about where I'm about to go. You say people need to wake up, meaning folks within the Democratic Party. What about the black community? Well, Trump well, had 12 percent in 2016, had 16% in 2020. Depending on which poll you look at, it's right. 12% now or it's 20% from the black community. It literally has vacillated between 12 and 20%. You've got people, you see him at rallies speculating about the black support that he knows he's going to get, et cetera, et cetera. I'm thinking, I, I can't imagine black folks, Biden got 87% of the black vote in 2020. I think that would be around the same this go round. Here's the difference. I don't know as if many if as many people will show up to the polls for right. this upcoming election that's the than key. did the last election. And, that's, and the that's where I think Trump could get an advantage, even if he's a convicted felon with four count, you know, four indictments and 91 counts against him. Even if he's a convicted felon, I still think he has a chance because not that many people are going to show up to the polls compared to 2020. Yep. And you remember, have, you say and, what to that? And, and remember, remember what you have seen since 2012, when the last time Obama ran, you have seen a decrease in black voter participation. Yes. Now, what you also have to understand, remember, Trump thanked black people for not voting in 2016. So what you're saying, what you're saying is correct. Now, yeah. what people have to understand is this here. And you and I are actually a part of the generation where the shift begin to happen. Black voters, 65 plus, identify as Democrats, 55, 55 to 64, less, but they still identify as Democrats. When you hit 55 and under, the number begins to drop. And so the further we get away from the black, um, from the civil rights movement, the black freedom movement, then you are seeing a different focus. So you're seeing African-Americans who are entrepreneurs who are focused on taxes. 2022, I was in Georgia doing stuff for Warnock. I talked to a black woman, owned a business, coffee shop. She said, look, I care about abortion, but I'm not having a baby. I own this business. I care more about taxes. She said, I'm listening to Herschel and Warnock. The people will go, wait a minute, this is a black woman. Black women hate Republicans more than anybody else. So what you're seeing is a new generation of African-Americans who have a different perspective than their parents. And so what Democrats, and this is where they made a mistake, Stephen, the old way of reaching black folks, tried and true, target civil rights groups, go to black churches, Focus on them early October for one month, five weeks. The mm. problem now is that, and I'll be very specific, white democratic strategists have got to get rid of the old playbook and realize you now have to actually micro-target black people, spend more money to get the same voters out, and that's what they've been unwilling to do. And now, do something for them more than once every four years. Right, and you have to articulate what you've done, explain how there's been an impact. So the problem from a, from a strategy standpoint, they've been unwilling to listen to black pollsters, black campaign strategists, and people on the ground. So the problem is, at, you can run all the TV ads you want to, but you got to be knocking door to door. It has to be old school politics. And so that's the well, you got to get black folks that's going to work on your campaign willing to go door to door, because let's that's, face reality, ain't a whole bunch of white people looking to knock door to door in black neighborhoods. Go. If we're being real about it, there you go. And then if you're talking about even our HBCUs, you have to be very clear. See, when I when the Biden folks go, we've um, we've allocated seven billion HBCUs. OK, that's a great number. But you got to say this here. 
the state of Florida allocated 122 million to FAMU. Mm. We gave FAMU 307 million. See, Joe Madison, God rest his soul. God rest his soul. Would always say, you got to put it where the goats can get it. Yes, he did. What they're doing is they're speaking in broad ways. No, it has to be very specific. It's, I love that scene from, uh, remember from Jungle Fever, when Flipper was like, mine, 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 mine. The yeah. Biden-Harris folks got to say, we built that and that and that. We restored that and that. They got to be specific. They got to be hammering over and over and over again. But they have to understand African-Americans are saying, what do I get for my vote? If you don't articulate what you've gotten, then they're going to assume I haven't gotten anything. And so that's that's the conundrum they are in. They have to actually spend more money and more time generating to get the same voters out. The old model, that's gone, bro. There are fewer people today who go to church than they did 10 years ago. That model ain't going to work. Right. It's done. Yeah. Showing up to the black church, thinking that's going to curry votes and increase that's your voting. Gone. That's, that's gone. not going to get it done. That's By gone. the way, last question before I, before I let you get on out of here. Donald Trump, uh, the former president, now the leading GOP candidate, obviously, was campaigning in South Carolina this Friday. And I know you saw this, but I'm going to because I just brought it up a few minutes ago, but I'm going to reiterate it for you specifically while I got you here speaking to an audience of mostly black Americans. I'm reading from the article of USA Today. Trump suggested and it says inaccurately that he is popular with African-American voters. He said his 91 criminal indictments and mug shots were part of the reason, quote, a lot of people said that's why the black people like me. That That's why the black people like me, because they have been hurt so badly and discriminated against. And they actually viewed me as I'm being discriminated against. This is what he said to an event. He said, it's been pretty amazing, but possibly maybe there's something there. This is what he's talking about. So he's comparing himself and his plight to that of black folks uh, in the United States of America. Roland Martin, take it away. You can't, t you can't show me a black person in America who could lie on a loan application and get millions of loans and still be able uh, to buy the business. You can't show me a black man who could sexually assault a, a woman, get convicted in civil court and got to pay $83 million and he's still walking around. And you damn sure can't show me no black man who took some classified documents to the crib, stuck them in the bathroom and they still free. Ain't no way in hell Donald Trump is remotely like uh, black folks who, who've been targeted by the DOJ. And we, we know COINTELPRO, okay? Donald Trump, you got in trouble because of what you did. Don't be trying to sit there and say we identify with that. But see, that's the pathology that exists there. And look, it's some people out there who are stuck on stupid, and they might say that stuff. But now, nah, bro, we're not getting away with that. And we we're not going to let him get away with it, Roland. But we know that a large, if not his entire contingent, will buy that hook, line, and sinker. And there are a plethora of black conservatives. And listen, I'm an independent. I don't always listen. I vote Democrat for the most part. The only person Republican I ever voted for was Governor Chris Christie because I couldn't stand Corazon in New Jersey. But in the same breath, I keep my eyes open on both sides of the aisle right. in terms of how they view certain things. But when it comes to folks... You're a black conservative. Even some of them are going to buy that hook, line, and sinker because they do right. believe that he's being pilloried and what have you because they're just trying to sway the election because right. the Dems can't beat him on their own. That's their thinking. Well, that's their thinking. But remember, they beat his behind once. And again, if Democrats focus and go on the offensive, they can give him that second L. And let me be real clear. We ain't wearing them ugly-ass shoes either. Right. Oh, by the way, you saw that you saw them parading around talking about those shoes are going to ingratiate Man, them please. with African Americans even more. I saw that on Fox News the other day. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe Plus, it. I ain't going to wear no shoes with no red bottom because I ain't trying to slip on the court. How about that? Like, I bet you, you bringing me up. You did. You taking a shot at me. I don't blame you. I deserve it. <laughs> I deserve it. <laughs> Appreciate you, big boy. Go ahead and enjoy that rodeo. Go I ahead and enjoy that rodeo. You. All right. Howdy, folks.
Howdy. Take it easy, bro. Thank All you. Right, Thanks again, man. Peace. The one and only Roland Martin. Roland Martin Unfiltered. Make sure you don't miss it. Got a best-selling book out there as well. We'll be talking about that a little bit more in the next few minutes as well. I'm not finished. I'm in finished. My, I might be finished talking to him. I'm not finished talking about him. He's doing some big things. The one and only Roland Martin. Appreciate you, big boy. Thank you so much. Welcome back to Stephen E. Smith Show. Today's fan tweets are brought to you by our newest sponsor, SeatGeek. And it couldn't have come at a better time. Because when my Knicks are going up against Steph and the Warriors and I'm looking for a hot deal, there's no question I'm going right to SeatGeek. And I'll tell you why. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. There are more than 70,000 events on SeatGeek, including concerts, sporting events, festivals, and more. That's why I'm excited to have a ticketing partner that helps the Stephen A. Smith Show listeners find tickets to all the big-time games. So you'll never miss your chance. See LeBron, Embiid. Giannis or Wimby. You'll never miss your chance to see those guys. They put all the tickets across the web in one place. So you find the best deals on what you want to do and who you want to see. Go now and download the SeatGeek app and use my code SAS for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's right. You heard me. $20 off your first purchase with promo code SAS. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. Now, let's read. Some of your fan tweets right here. Okay, let's get right to it, please. Let's see here. What's your favorite seasoning and sauce? <sighs> Who knows? I mean, shoot. Paprika. I love paprika. No doubt about that. Um, and believe it or not, when I'm eating my steak, I love Bernays sauce. I do. I do. Those are the, those are the answers to my question. Uh, Sean, at Coach Sean Bell writes, who's the most disrespected athlete who is currently playing their respective sport? Disrespected. Hmm. I'd have to say, of all the disrespected athletes I can point to, believe it or not, despite the fact that I can be critical sometimes, I'd go with LeBron James. I mean, when you're a four-time champion, four-time league MVP, you're playing in your 21st season, third, age 39 years of age, you're about to eclipse 40,000 points for your career. You're the all-time leading scorer in NBA history with the accolades that you've achieved. Surefire, first ballot, Hall of Fame, and not a single vote should be against him. The level of appreciation we should have for him and his greatness, um, we don't give him enough credit. We can say that, but I'm going to take it a step further. What I appreciate most about him is his conditioning. He should be an inspiration to all of us. Because when I watch LeBron James, I marvel at the fact that the brother never, ever appears out of shape. Ever. And I got to give credit where credit is due to that. Um, next up, look at this guy. At Fed Aguirre, right? How much would a wood, how much wood would a wood chuck chuck? If a woodchuck could chuck wood. That's some elementary school shit you threw at me right there. When I was in elementary school, I had an answer. I'm a bit older now. I don't remember. So I have no answer to your question. But I appreciate it. I do. Last but not least, at Butt Crack Sports. What kind of damn name is that? Butt Crack Sports? To my producers, make sure this is the last time I get a question from this, this site, this, this, whoever the hell this person is. This is ridiculous. Put the tinfoil hat on for a second. What conspiracy theories do you believe? I believe aliens really exist on the planet Earth. I don't think it's an accident that Independent Day was out. I, I, don't, I don't think like that. I, I don't think that as human beings on the planet Earth, we're the only species in this universe. I don't believe in that. I, I, you know, I ain't going to lie to you. I, it went, I wouldn't put it past it. I mean, I'm not going to say I walk around thinking about it. Oh, my Lord, I'm fearful of it. You remember that movie, They Live, that starred Rowdy Roddy Piper? And remember when you had to put on these glasses, and if you put on the glasses, you could see certain people who were aliens and certain people who were not? Remember that? I think about movies like that. I think about movies like Independence Day. I think about movies like Men in Black, one and two specifically, with Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. You know, I think Will Smith was in the third one as well. I'm just saying I think about stuff like that. 
I would tell you that that stuff to me is not far fetched. I don't think about it much. I ain't walking around panicking or anything like that. I just think that when we're talking about inspecting the moon and walking on the moon and going to Mars and all of this other, for us to think that we're the only creatures in the universe is just, it's, 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 it's ignorant. I do believe. And what is the definition of an alien? Somebody that's not from here. You see what I'm saying? So for me, is every species something that was made to be on Earth? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. That's what I think. Don't think about it much. But to answer your question directly and as, as honestly as I possibly can, that's where I'm at with it. Anyway, that's it for this today's edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I'll be back with you in a couple of days or so. Hope y'all enjoyed it. Thanks again to the one and only Roland Martin for coming on the show and discussing and apprising us of a little bit of politics because obviously this is an election year. So what goes on is pertinent. It's relevant. And anything that's pertinent and relevant is something that I want to touch on. So stay tuned. It'll be more of that coming on. You're listening and watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube and beyond. Until next time, everybody. Peace and love.